Statistics, T distribution graph showing degrees of freedom. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently... First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one, because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because, apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com in the OneNote presentation section, 1954 T distribution graph showing degrees of freedom tab, looking at a scenario similar to recent practice problems, except this time we're looking at the T distribution graph as opposed to the normal distribution graph, leading us to some questions such as, What's the difference between a T-distribution and a normal distribution? When might we use a T-distribution as opposed to the normal distribution? How does the T-distribution graph change with the change in degrees of freedom? What are the degrees of freedom? How do we calculate that? So quick look at the T-distribution graph. So here's an example of some T-distribution graphs. And when we look at them, we are probably thinking, hey, that looks just like a normal distribution. That's a bell curve. They look quite similar. However, when we're thinking about a normal distribution bell curve, we note that we can define it with just two numbers. Usually the middle point is going to be the mean, and then we have the standard deviation of the spread. And within two standard deviations, if it was a bell curve, the middle part would add up to around 95%. With the T distributions, one, there's going to be multiple t distributions that's the first thing we need to know because the actual graph will in essence change with the degrees of freedom which is a little bit more subtle of something we have to keep in our mind when working in excel than we used to have to do because it used to be the case that we'd have to look up the graph like in a table for different levels of degrees of freedom which would give us a clear indication that we're talking about different graphs whereas when we're constructing these calculations as well as the graphs in Excel, then Excel will pick the proper graph depending on the degrees of freedom. So we have to remember that it will actually change with different levels of degrees of freedom. But when compared to the bell-shaped curve, it's going to have fatter tails on the ends. That means that more area is going to be under the tails of the graph, which means that if we're looking for a range around the middle point, then it's going to have to be a little bit wider. We're going to be needing a larger range, something greater than two standard deviations away in order to achieve the same level of 95%. And that would make sense because when we're looking at these T distributions, we're usually looking at situations where, where possibly we have less information and therefore it would make sense that we would need a wider range to get say the same like confidence interval type of calculation so that's going to be the general idea now when might we use the t distributions so with a with a t with a normal distribution you will recall that if we have our set of data and the data is in the format of a bell-shaped curve then we might be able to use obviously a, a normal distribution to approximate it but sometimes the data isn't in a bell-shaped curve. Uh, sometimes it's going to be a uniform distribution skewed to the left, skewed to the right, and so on and so forth, in which case we try to take advantage of the central limit theorem by basically saying, let's imagine that we took all possible samples of whatever sample size and took the average of all of them, that data would tend towards a bell-shaped curve, in which case we have the center point, which would be the same center point of the data, center point of a sample, center point of our imagined all made up samples of sample size, but the standard deviation would be different, right? Because you have the standard deviation of the population, standard deviation of the sample, which would tend toward the population, and then the standard deviation 
of all possible combinations which we would approximate with a formula. That's the general idea. Now, if we didn't have the standard deviation of the population, we can try to estimate it with the standard deviation of the sample. However, if we have, if we have a situation where we don't have a lot of a large sample size, then we might run into problems with the, the central limit theorem kind of kicking in. And so if we don't have the standard deviation of the population and we have a fairly small sample size, then that's a common case when we might kick over to a T distribution uh, type of situation. So normally we're thinking the data hopefully is still like in the a bell-shaped curve. So we're talking about things that would be errors or things like the average height of people or average size of a worm, which the data is tending towards a bell curve. So it doesn't matter so much that whether the central limit theorem kind of kicks in. And we're usually talking about not knowing the standard deviation of the population. And we're thinking that the population, uh, our sample size is fairly small. Uh, and therefore, we can use the T distributions that can maybe approximate it more accurately and have these little bit wider tails that will result in a larger range than the normal distribution. Now, note that as the, as the sample size goes up, then you're going to get something that's going to get smaller tails, which will tend more towards a normal distribution. So you might be able to still use you know, T distributions even if you have a larger sample but it might be the case that it's going to tend more towards a t a, a normal distribution as the sample size basically gets larger all right so that's going to be the general idea so let's just say how do we graph these two items so if we took a sample count of only two that would be a very small sample right so now we're imagining a situation where the central limit theorem might not and remember the idea of the central limit theorem kicking in remember like n is the sample size we would like n to be larger larger is better but it's not like a, a straight line relationship in terms of how large n has to be to increase level of confidence because that's our analogy of how much salt is in the soup right we need a good sized teaspoon to taste the soup whether it is a a can of soup or a large kettle of soup uh so so once we get past a certain point we might not it might not be adding as much value to have in to continue going up but if it's very small then that's going that could result in a sample that's not going to be as good of course right and this and the next question is well is the sample large enough for the central limit theorem to kick in or to take advantage of the fact that the data is in a bell-shaped curve and and again same idea if it was above 30 or 50 or something like that you would think the central limit theorem concept would kick in, but if it's two, it might not. And that also might not be enough for us to take advantage of the data, even if it was in a bell-shaped uh, kind of curve, right? So that's gonna be uh, the issue. Uh, so, we, and then we have a sample size of 100, which is gonna give us to almost 100, basically gives us to like the maximum size here so so which again is a fairly small sample size if you were talking about a large population right and then you've got the degrees of freedom the way you calculate the degrees of freedom is easy you're just going to take the sample size minus the number of samples and in our case we're just going to imagine that we have one sample that we took therefore it's just going to be whatever the sample size is in this case two minus one is one in this case we had a sample size of 100 minus one is going to be 99. so then if we were to graph this it's a little wonky to graph the t distributions because it basically wants to graph kind of like in z scores with zero in the middle but we're going to call them the t's right so you can imagine this remember when we're talking about normal distributions if we were to graph a normal distribution we can think about two different x axes down here one measuring it in x whatever x is if we were measuring heights we might talk about inches or centimeters or whatever and and then we can measure it in z's which is the standard deviations here we're thinking kind of like we're measuring in t's right which is basically equivalent to the z's equivalent to the t distribution standard deviation which again is not really uniform over all t graphs because the 
you know, we have different T graphs based on the degrees of freedom that we're going to be using. All right, so if we go from negative three up to positive three, we just graphed out, uh, and, and, and that's going to be a long set of numbers going from negative three to 2.99 to 2.98 and so on and so forth until it turns positive, until it goes up to positive three. That is our range from negative three here to positive three. And then our calculation is t dot dist. So we have similar kind of uh, formulae with a normal distribution. If so, if, if you've been following along with our normal distributions course or section, then this will be a similar but a little different. And then we're going to be picking up the x, which is going to be this one, degrees of freedom. So that's the key component, which in this case is one sample size minus uh, the num the number of samples is going to give us one for this one and and then is it cumulative or not we're going to say no because we're going to graph each of these points so if we do that we get this one and uh and so that's going to be uh the the flatter one which makes sense because it has fatter tails which means that if we want to get 95 percent in the middle we're going to have to go significantly out further than just two standard deviations away right is going to be the general idea and then if i looked at this one at 100 so let's say we had a sample size of 100 then we could have the same the same numbers 3 2.99 and then we calculate this one which is going to be the t distribution of x which is three and then the degrees of freedom this time however is 100 minus one because there's only one sample we're imagining or 99 and you can see what happens to the graph. Now you can, if we do this in Excel and set this up in Excel in another course or section, if you want to check that out and you can play with these numbers, changing the, the sample size of either of these, right? To whatever you want it to be. And you can see what, what happens to the graph. So if I change this two to like a five, this one's going to get a little bit taller. The tails are going to get a little bit thinner going to tend towards more looking like a normal distribution with a smaller tail and then if i change it to you know 10 it's going to go up a little bit more and so on and so forth when i get like to 40 it's going to be pretty close to this one up here and then when i get to like close to 100 it's you have a pretty tall one it's not going to go up much from there so we're talking about the changes in the and the graphs are going to be changing a lot on the smaller end of the sample sizes right and that's the idea because that ends up with these wider uh tails now i'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail on how the t distributions were create created it's kind of an interesting thing uh to think about how you know how they came how they derive the degrees of freedom and how that comes out to the t distribution graphs that tend to be quite accurate given that you know given the data that has been come up but in our case i just want to think about it from a practical situation in terms of when might we use the t distributions what are the t distributions how do we apply the t distributions and again the idea is nor we'd like to do a normal distribution but uh if we can't do that then and we might not be able to do that when we have situations where we don't know uh possibly the middle point the mean of the population or the standard deviation of the population. And again, we have a small amount of sample size is fairly small then. Uh, that's when, uh, and because the sample size is small, we're hoping that the actual data itself is tending towards a, a bell-shaped curve. And that's when, the, that's when these uh, T distribution could work. Again, if the if the sample size gets larger, then you might still be able to use the T distribution if you don't know the standard deviation. But once the sample size gets pretty big, the, this curve is going to tend more towards, you know, a normal distribution. And it, if N is large, you know, in, in, some, in that case, then you might be able to use the normal distributions because I've, even though you don't know the standard deviation, you might be able to approximate it with the standard deviation of the sample approximating the standard deviation of the population and then hopefully be able to use the central limit theorem in our formula for uh for a normal distribution so that's kind of the general idea again you can we'll play around with these if you go to the excel uh the excel part and you can kind of play around with these 
formulas. It's a little tricky to try to graph the t distributions in an example problem because you can see here, given the, the inputs, that it always wants to graph around kind of zero. So it's a little, we'll have an example problem where we, where we try to graph uh, the t distributions in an example, but it's, it's a little bit tricky. You could still approximate it with normal distributions, however, in a practice problem, just to get a graph so you can kind of visualize uh, visualize where things line up in the graph, which I think we did and showed in a prior example problem.